Hey friends, I uh, wanted to talk about finding your vow. This is something that has been on my mind a lot recently for the empowerment department and the work I'm doing there <clears throat> at the service guild and really helping people to come into contact with their vow and articulate it and learning how to do that. And to some extent, this has been a process of both reverse engineering what happened for me and looking at the other people that I know and seeing what happened for them and wanting to be in a position of helping people, empowering them to go on that path themselves. And so I just wanted to really ramble aloud about how I'm currently thinking about this. Uh, this is so important to me, this concept of a vow and so instrumental in my life. It's one of the most fundamental ways of seeing that I currently have. and. Um, so fundamental to my work at the empowerment department and also just my life, how I relate to it. And it's just, I just want to start by acknowledging that because it feels a little bit like many of these topics that I talk about, just a little bit intense to sort of say, oh, this is how I see it because I just know how I see this is going to unfold over time. And also other people see it differently. So, um, I'd love to hear how you think about vows and callings and purposes. Please feel free to share how you see it or if you see it differently than I do. But this is this is my current thinking this particular morning about how to find your vow and to live it. Um, I think the first thing to do is to come to some kind of conception or understanding or language also and, and mythology and sense-making and aesthetics of what a vow is. And often that word does not resonate for people. It sounds like commitment or obligation or like promise, and that can feel burdensome or overwhelming and whatever. If that's you, just toss it out. Like vow has just happened to be the word that my teacher, so you, so you shared with me that he teaches about finding your vow. That resonates for me. I like to use that word, but if it doesn't resonate for you, just, just toss it right out the window. <laughs> the word is the least important part of this. Um, maybe the word calling or vocation or um, purpose or um, quest or some other word resonates for you. There were so many words and phrases for this. Um, and, and maybe you need to find your own. But finding not only a word, but some sense making of, of what the universe is, what the world is, who you are, and what your relationship to the universe is. This is a question I've been asking my whole life. Like, what is the universe? Why are we alive? What is this world? Who am I? What am I here to do? Is there meaning? Is there not meaning? And this concept of a vow, what it refers to, has been the best answer that I've found so far. That we're here to do something. That we're here to do something. That we came here to do something. And for me, this is very, just straightforwardly, very connected to a sense of reincarnation being part of how the universe works. Uh, I have not directly witnessed past lives or anything like that, but this is a traditional Buddhist teaching, of course, that I believe is consonant with other teachings, even, even Christian teachings of, um, you know, heaven and hell being realms. Um, those are more like future oriented, like what happens after you die. But um, anyway, it just makes sense of my life in a lot of ways. And that, that's probably a whole other video, like how I came to believe in reincarnation or whatever. But this concept of a vow does not need to be tied to Buddhism. It does not need to be tied to reincarnation. It's it's coming to some sense of who you are and what the world is and, and what your relationship with the world is and that, that seems resonant and true for you. And and this word vow that I use is, is a reference to um, almost like a gravitational location that is found by many traditions of, hey, there is something like a life purpose or a calling or a vocation, and you should really look at that. <laughs> um, however you conceive of it, like God gave you something that you need to do in this life, or you promised you would do something before you were born, or you just have this calling that is arising as you live your life, or, you know, you have a vow, which, which is a specific way that I hold it. Um, it's all good, but finding your own sense of that, not only conceptually, not only the language, of course, those things, but also really feeling, ah, this is, this is what a vow is. This is what has happened in my life. This is part of why, incidentally, why I love the question, 
you know, what's your life story that I ask everyone on my podcast because it's kind of like the lifetime equivalent of how is your day going? It's like, what's been happening for you? Like, how do you make sense of what's happening? And I love asking that question because it's very, very closely related to like, what is your vow? If you know the circumstances of your life or someone's life, that is um, very proximal to, very close to this, what their vow is. And I love to see that in people. So the first step is just to really wrestle with this. Of like, is there such a thing as a calling or a purpose or a vocation or a vow? And, and to make some sense of that, to find what that refers to in your own experience and sense making. Just that that's possible. And, and um, there's a, mm, well, yeah, so I'll set that aside for now. Um, and then it's just kind of a question of how do you find your vow? And I think having started to believe that there is such a thing as a calling and a purpose and a vow and a vocation, however you conceive of it, it's really important to look at what that is almost ontologically. You know, I was very interested in philosophy when I was a younger man, and I'm not especially interested in it anymore. But ontology is the study of what something is. It's giving an account of what something is, what its being is, and answering the question, what is this? What is this? So in this case, what is a calling? What is a calling? What is a calling? You have to answer a what is question before you answer particulars of it. Like, what is my calling? Or, you know, how do callings work? You know, and specific questions about their particulars, you have to just ask what it is. This is what Socrates through Plato said, is you have to find the what is question first. What is virtue? You have to find that before asking whether it can be taught. Which incidentally is not an unrelated question to what is a vow. And for me, there's, there's sort of the fundamental ontological view of what a vow is, which is it is your life. That to me cre creates an axiom of, of course you have a vow because you're alive. You just are alive. And as you are alive, you are behaving and your behavior has consequences. Your actions have consequences. So your vow is both your life, your behavior during it, and the consequences that those actions have both during and after your life. And from a reincarnationist perspective, it also, I believe, includes the sort of karmic story that you come into this life with. Um, but you can set that aside if you're not a reincarnationist. So what it fundamentally is, is your life, you living, and specifically the behavior that you do, the actions you take, and the effects those actions have, including after you die. That's what a vow is. And then we have to relate to that somehow, because our life has not been fully lived yet. I think so often of this thing that Solon said in Plutarch's Lives and elsewhere, where Solon said, you cannot judge whether a man was happy until after he died. And in the same way, you can't really fully know or make sense of what someone's vow was until after they died. But you're in media res. We just all are in media res. We're in the middle of the thing and we have to be like, well, how am I going to relate to this? And so from that perspective of you are at a specific moment in time, you're in a specific chapter of your life, a specific season, you have to relate to some concept of who you are, some way of making sense of who you are and what your vow in particular is. And it's useful to have a concept or a story that you tell yourself and others about what your vow is. And from a meditation or contemplative practice perspective, this is um, sort of already a type error of you are turning something that is actually action and effects into a concept or a story about self. But if you can do that in a way that's not clinging to that concept of self, if you're not attached to that concept of self, where you realize that it's empty, that you can just toss it away and tell a new story, it's just a story, it's just a tale, then you can relate to that skillfully and be like, ah, this is a good story in this moment of my life to tell about who I am and what I'm doing. And so you, it's just very useful. It's like a compass to steer by of, ah, this is who I am. This is how I will make choices based on the story. And I, this is how I will communicate who I am to other people. And you can totally change this story. I've done this countless times in my life. We all do, but it's worth learning to tell a good story about who you are and one that's resonant for you, that's inspiring for you and also for other people so that they can really coordinate with you and interact with you. Ah, this is what you're on about. This is what you're doing. How can I help? Because ultimately a vow is about service. It's about being of benefit 
to other beings in a very broad definition of service, but it's intimately connected to all other beings and all other people in your life and the world that you find yourself in in particular. Ah, you are alive at this specific moment in time. How can you be of service to this world that you find yourself in? So the question then, if you have a sense, oh, there are such a thing as callings, of course, fundamentally, it's, it's just my life, me being alive, the actions I take and the effects those have, but it's useful to tell a story about who I am and have a concept of self that's inspiring for myself and others, then how do you find that story and develop a concept of who you are that is useful for you, that is a benefit for you to steer by and to tell other people? And my sense is there's a lot, a lot, a lot of different ways to do this and this unfolds in time and you know, you can try one thing and maybe it doesn't work and then you try something else, but you're sort of wayfinding your way to something that's more and more true that matches the shape of your life more and more, that's more and more resonant for you, that's more and more useful to other people. And also on a meta level, getting better and better at the skill of telling the story to other people, communicating who you are and how you understand yourself in a way that's useful for them, that allows them to interface with you and yeah, be of more service, because when you connect other people, you can collaborate with them, you can um, do bigger acts of service that are of more benefit. Of course, this is all very much starting to bleed into my own sense making about these things, rather than just an abstract, like, noticing that callings are a thing, which many teachers and traditions and paths have. Anyways, so how do you do that? Um, here's a few ways. Um, I think the very first thing is to notice what you're called towards. Often we have these ideas of, oh, I should do this. I want to do this. This thing feels really resonant for me. Maybe I should volunteer at this place, or maybe I should go to some specific country and see it, or maybe I need to read that book. It could be anything. Some action that some part of you is like, oh, I think that would be a good idea. And that can arise in different ways. But if you have some kind of calling or draw to doing something, then acting on that, really acting on that. And this can be hard because on the one hand, you may not understand why you're called to that thing. It's like, ah, this doesn't make sense. Like for me, one of the classic examples is I got super interested in military strategy while being a monk <laughs> at the monastic academy. It's like, why is a monk interested in military strategy? It didn't quite make sense to me. It didn't quite make sense to my friends, but okay, I, I guess I'm really interested in this and I just want to read a lot about military strategy. And so, okay, I will do that. But it also might be weird, like maybe, I mean, often with our vow, it's like you're unique and the world has never seen quite something like you before. And it's like, oh, I haven't seen this before. And that's weird. Um, and, and somehow just to trust what you're called to and do it in a way that resonates for you and feels ethical, um, even when you don't understand why, even when it's weird, even when it's scary, even if there's resistance to it, doing the thing you know you should do, that you feel called to. And conversely, it's really important to stop doing things you know you shouldn't do. So many of us have habits that we're like, yeah, that's not helping me, that's not helping the world. It's almost like like luggage that you're carrying around and when you put it down, you're, you're lighter and you're freer and you're more able to go in the direction of, of your vow. So if there's something you know you need to stop doing, then you stop doing that. And you can build up to that, of course. Say you have four bad habits that you know you need to stop doing, you can do the easiest one first and be like, yeah, I'm gonna stop, um, I don't know, whatever it is. But you don't have to do it all in one day, but just steering towards, yeah, this isn't working for me and I'm gonna stop doing that. So doing what you know you should do, stopping doing what you shouldn't do, these are really related to the th three pure precepts. Um, Peace Pilgrim also talks about this. Um, really love. Both of those have been so influential to me. It's worth looking up the three pure precepts. I also have this uh, video for, uh, that I made with Michael Kersey about Peace Pilgrim from a passage of her work about following your highest light. That's essentially pointing to the same thing. What else do you do? Um, try things. Just try things. You're like, oh, I want to try this and you can the way this comes from Kenevan but the phrase I keep finding myself telling people is try multiple safe to fail experiments in parallel ideally they're small safe to fail experiments in parallel 
excuse me, I'm just feeling a little bit allergic right now. This is because from a Kinevin perspective, um, this is a strategy tool which you can read about in my Strategy 101. Finding your vow is a complex problem where there's no known solution, but there are causal relationships. And so you can try experiments that help you steer towards finding what your vow is. And so, um, for example, you could like join a club and you could organize an event and you could reach out to someone and ask them to be your mentor. And those could all be small, safe to fail experiments. Uh, maybe they're more or less large, but something, reading a book, you try multiple things and then you see what resonates. And then maybe that leads you to realizing, oh, I should do this or I should stop doing that. Um, that's extremely helpful. One of the things I would really suggest trying is doing a small, feasible service project that's fun for you. Finding a, a project that's fun for you, that's feasible to do, that will be a benefit in the world. And doing that will cause you to grow and be more in alignment with who you are. So that's that's a whole process of finding a specific project that you want to do that's a benefit. This is what we help people do in the empowerment department. Um, finding a specific service project that is connected to their vow, that resonates for them, that helps people move forwards in their path towards living their vow. That's an incredibly useful strategy is doing a service project that's fun for you. Um, ideally small, one that you actually complete. As I say, it's important to give your gift. If you, if you think of a gift for a friend, you give it to them on their birthday or whatever occasion it is. And it's, it's not very nice to think of the gift and even buy it and then not give it. So really put the effort into finishing the project and completing it, not only so that it's a benefit to the world, but also importantly, so that you get the feedback from the world of, oh, we really loved this, or we didn't like this, or this worked, this didn't work. Typically, you'll get both kinds of feedback, positive, encouraging feedback, and also constructive feedback. Every, every service project is going to get some of both of those kinds of feedback. And, and then you listen to that. That, that's, that information is critical for steering towards the next service project, the next way that you show up with your vow. Another thing is just to practice telling this story to yourself and other people. Here's who I think I am. Here's what I think I'm on about. This is what I understand about myself and telling people, ah, this is, this is who Tashin is or whatever your name is. Tell people about yourself, especially friends or mentors or people you work with. Tell them like, hey, this is who I think I am and what I'm here to do. And you know, this, this what you say may be more or less refined, both in how you articulate it and also your own internal sense making of it. But just practicing telling people that is so useful. And again, they give you the kind of feedback of like, wow, that really resonates. And that seems like that's true about you or, oh, I'm not so quite sure about this or something like that. Or, 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 or even the best thing is when they reflect something you didn't know about yourself of like, wow, you're really good at this thing. Didn't you, didn't you notice that you're really good at that thing? And often, as many people have pointed out, the, the thing that is in our, what you might call zone of genius, is, can be difficult for us to see because it's so common for us and so easy for us that we're like, what, do you, other people have a hard time with this or don't see this or whatever? And that is right where your vow is, the thing that's right in your blind spot because it's so common for you, it's so easy for you, you do it all the time, it's, you can't help it, but other people don't seem to. That's, that's um, I think Visa has pointed this out, that um, looking at what's easy for you that's hard for other people is uh, just an incredible way to find your vow. And he doesn't use that term, but to steer towards how you want to show up in the world, to really leaning on your strengths. Um, there are other ways I can think of specific exercises you can do to find your vow. Those are some of the ones that have been helpful to me as I look back on my own path and my own life. Um, and they're the ones I'd suggest for now. Uh, I hope some of this is helpful to you. I'd love to hear any thoughts you have about what a vow is or how you make sense of that, what a calling is, a vocation, a purpose. Um, I'd love to hear thoughts about what your vow is. I love when my friends tell me, hey, here's what I think my vow is and trust me with that. And that helps me to steer by that and help them if I can. And uh, also if you have gone through this, own, this process in your own way, I'd love to hear what's worked for you and what's helped you. Please do feel free to write whatever you like in the comments, provided it's kind and, uh, you know, so on. But I uh, would love to hear from you and hear what you think about any of that or anything else that comes up for you. Okay, 
be well, friends, and uh, enjoy the journey of living your vow.